Hi everyone, my name is Andy Colley. Um, I am a computer science teacher from Manchester in the UK and I've been working with Replit to develop some of the Python curricula that are available on the Replit site in the curriculum section. Now, what I'm going to do in this first video is just tell you a little bit about the thinking and the pedagogy behind those curricula. Um, this is how you can get in touch with me if you've got any questions. You can find me on Twitter there or you can email me at andy at learningdust.com. So, I am self-taught computer science teacher. I had to switch subjects a few years ago and I have been learning a lot about programming, about the rest of the computer science curriculum ever since. Um, and what I find when I'm programming, especially when, I'm a no when I was a novice, is that I was in one of two states. I either knew exactly what I was doing and I was perfectly capable, which was rare, or there was a big gulf and I had no idea what was going on. And I think as experts and as teachers and as people who interact with code and interact with problem solving day to day, we can often forget how hard it is for our novice learners here, our novice learners, our beginners, um, to get from here to here. There's a huge gap. And so the pedagogy that I've used in planning the Replit resources is called PRIM. And it helps create more of a scaffolding between being a novice and being an expert. Because this is what Amjad said about coding. They don't get into coding for the loops and if statements. They do it for the superpowers it gives them. However, I would argue that, you know, if you're going to play a musical instrument, you're not going to jump on it for the first time and start kicking out a solo, are you? Um, I'm not going to teach a kid clarinet by giving it them and letting them off to discover on their own i'm going to teach them the fundamentals i'm going to teach them the scales where to put your fingers which end to blow into and so with this the same goes with code well, you get the superpowers from understanding the fundamentals a lot of people who learn to code are hobbyists they do it because they're motivated they are employees so they've got a what's in it for them but a lot of the people in my classroom have maybe one lesson a week for eight weeks, large class, they can't get a lot of personalised feedback, the teacher might still be on a learning curve like I was and I still am, um, and it's one subject amongst many. And finally, their goal is far in the future, there's no direct reward for them to learn this skill. So a lot of the time it's difficult for them to help see the point. So what we've got to do is break things down and give them clear direct instruction, lots of examples, lots of practice to help them build their skills and build their confidence. Because otherwise you stay stuck at the novice level for ages and it's very demotivating. So learning this program can be difficult because even one line of code can contain so many different concepts to be unpicked. It's very syntactically dense. Let's look at this, a very simple line of Python code. In here we've got a variable, we've got to know what one of those is. We've got an assignment operator, two things there. Casting to an integer, well what's an integer? It's a data type. And we've got to cast, well why have we got to cast? Input, what's input? How many different types of input are there? Why does this happen? And here we've got some text, which is a string. And it's got to go in speech marks. And if you miss the speech marks off, your code doesn't work. And you've opened two brackets here, so you've got to close two. So we've got more syntax there. And that's one line of code. Um, so it creates what we call a high cognitive load. There is a heck of a lot going on there, even just with the writing of the code. And before you get to that stage, You've got to understand the problem to be solved. You've got to be able to decompose that into small parts, and then you've got to translate it into your syntax. There is a heck of a lot we're asking of our young people here. And so Prim and the activities I've planned around based on that help break that down. And it works like this. We have fully worked examples at the start, a couple to reinforce. We have partially worked examples for students to finish off. We have queued starts and then we do move to independent tasks and a lot of the student time will be spent probably in these first two stages for beginner programmers to really reinforce and let them see lots of examples with code that is not theirs. If you want to simplify this, 
we go from predict and run code that's been pre-written, investigate and answer questions about code that's been pre-written, modify, take example code and change it, and then we move on to make. So we're moving from not my code to partly my code to all my code. And a lot of my students spend a long time in this cycle here, moving on to modify. And what this does is it gives me a lot of information about whether they've learned what I'm trying to teach them so that I can intervene and give them examples, give them more practice. But the make stage here is always there for those students who are ready to move on. And I can, because I've got accurate information from these two stages, I can move students onto these stages as and when they are ready. So this is what PRIM stands for. Predict and run the code like a science experiment. Look at the code, write down what you think it's going to do, run it, check whether you were right. Investigate, look at the code that you've been given and answer various questions about it. Identify parts of it, predict output, um, follow the flow through, identify structure. Um, questions like that to let me know as a teacher whether my students have really understood their code. Modify, take code I've given you and change the way it works using the skills I'm trying to teach you. And finally, make, here are some situations um, you might get a bit of queued start code. You might get an algorithm to help you with that. You might get very specific step-by-step -step instructions in plain English, or as you get more advanced, it becomes more like a generic problem description um, for you to go away and make your own code. And by the time you've got to here, or they've got to here, your students have seen lots of examples. They have really practiced their code comprehension, um, and they should have a much better understanding of um, what the code is, how it works and what it does and seen it used in different problems so that that will help them with their modify and make they'll have much more reference material to draw on and that should then reduce that cognitive load so that they can concentrate their brain power on solving the problem in front of them rather than trying to remember what bracket goes where so that's prim in the next video i'm going to take you through um, a, an example unit from one of my one of my Python resources on Replit. Again, if you've got any questions or you want to um, get in touch, you can find me, and I'll zap back through all these slides. You can find me here at Mr. A. Colley on Twitter or at Andy at LearningDust.com. Thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to hearing from you soon.